are here with Rich Clarida, the global strategic advisor at PIMCO, manager of the world's largest bond fund. He was a senior economist in the George W. Bush administration. G20 is coming up. There's a Fed policy meeting just around the corner, so we have tons to speak with Rich about. So glad you could join us here in the newsroom this morning, Rich. Thanks for coming in. We just alluded to your experience in the Bush administration. You have had to engineer huge plans, big picture. Will QE2 work? That's the question on most people's minds right now. Well, QE2 will work in the narrow sense that it will, it will lower interest rates and it will keep interest rates lower than they would otherwise be. I have no doubt about that. It worked the last time with the mortgage program. The real question is, will those lower interest rates and potentially a weaker dollar which could flow from QE, will it jumpstart an economy which is really just sort of, you know, disappointing growth at one and a half or two percent, not enough to lower the unemployment rate. So yes, it'll lower rates. The question mark is, will that generate economic growth? What do you think? Uh, I think in the near term, there's a lot of headwinds against the economy. The Fed acknowledges that. The hope is by 011, QE will be supportive of growth. Uh, I hope it is, but I have some questions. Sure. Now, I guess we should talk about the, the hows it's all done. I mean, there's a lot of choices in there. We yeah. heard from New York Fed President Bill Dudley yeah. saying, 500 billion for example so we don't know if that's exactly what he was suggesting but now that that number is out there yeah. I, I mean how could that 500 billion be deployed what's the best way to do it if we get down to the nuts and bolts yeah. what's the plan I think we know how it's going to be deployed they've been pretty clear that they're going to focus on the Treasury market they're going to buy treasuries probably between the five and the ten year point what the traders call the belly of the curve uh, and but but the important point is that because the Fed's been talking about QE2 in some form really since August a lot of this is already priced into markets. Yes. So market, markets aren't going to wait till QE2 is actually announced. They're already pricing in the impact. So does the Fed have to announce $1 trillion <laughs> well, or something to get any effects? Well, I think there is an ongoing discussion inside about whether you announce the so-called shock and awe number or whether or not you announce a program that could be substantial but will be revisited uh, over time. So the details are going to be very important, but the bottom line is the markets, both in the, the level of the dollar as well as uh, interest rates in the Treasury market, have priced this in. Rich, you know, the Fed has said it wants to go for a portfolio effect, which to me means you have to buy maybe something other than Treasuries. Uh, What's the best thing for an investor well, to do? Th that's an excellent point. I think in this context, though, when the Fed says a portfolio effect, they mean the belly of the curve. They mean buying the five to ten year point in the treasury curve as opposed to the very front end. You can't really lower th three month T-bill rates. They're almost zero anyway. So to have an impact, you've got to move out. Yeah. Rich, I know there's a lot to talk about relative to the G20, but one of the issues that's going to come up because it's very much on the minds of the folks running the Swiss National Bank is about setting monetary policy using short term interest rates. Has there been a disruption between the connection that existed between price stability and financial stability? And if so, does that mean central banks can't use short-term interest rates the way they used to? We've seen folks like the Swiss National Bank with their hands tied fighting a currency battle with unconventional means, perhaps as a result. Excellent question. I would, I would make two observations. The first is that we've certainly learned in this crisis that price stability is not sufficient to ensure financial stability. We had a lot of price stability in the last decade. We didn't end up with a lot of financial stability. So price stability is not enough. We're currently in a situation where central banks can't use short-term interest rates as a policy tool because they're basically at zero, which is why we have quantitative easing. I think the interesting question as we look out ahead uh, several years uh, will be as we return to normal, and it may be a new normal, the role that setting interest rates will play relative to these quantitative measures. The Fed would like to exit and talked a lot about exit in June and July, but right now we're nowhere near exit. We're going to do another round of QE. So I think to be determined on the second part of your question. So, Rich, obviously low rates won't help the economy. I know that's a point that you made this week. You were speaking to the Boston uh, Federal Reserve Bank yeah. Conference, and you gave up and gave a pretty interesting speech. You said, I'm not going to get up here and say, I told you so yeah. for everything that's happened, particularly in the past two years. I'm just wondering, did anybody laugh? I mean, what was the <laughs> tone like? Uh, maybe there was a chuckle or two uh, in the uh, in the audience, uh, but no, I think I think it was a serious crowd of, of Fed officials and market participants and academics. Uh, and I, I guess the point of my paper was that the conference was about how do we conduct monetary policy in a low inflation environment. And my point is you can't answer that question without assessing how we got into the current low inflation environment, and that of course was the combination of policy and the financial crisis. So my paper focused a lot on the causes of the financial crisis.
Well, speaking of policy, the G20 is coming up. I mean, there's a lot of talk about these currency wars. A cynic would say there's no way to get anything done. What, what's the best case scenario? What's the best thing that comes out of this weekend, especially from someone who's been in the position where you had to be at a negotiating table? Yeah, well, realistically, I let me be the glasses half full here. I actually think we're pretty close to the, the doable best case scenario. We'll have a statement, a communique which your, your viewers should know is being drafted now, even though they haven't met yet. We're having a communique uh, that will probably address the currency issue. Secretary Geithner has basically laid out dividing the world into three groups. You've got the floaters, the U.S., the G7. You've got countries like Brazil that are using limited capital controls to stem the pace of appreciation but not prevent it. And then you've got countries, China, that are very, very... Uh, close to a pegged exchange rate. And essentially, the communique will uh, uh, address that, and I think uh, we'll do it effectively. But for Geithner, let's just say, to, to sell this plan, I'll yeah. use a kind of crude word, what does China get? Well, here's the challenge, and it's a great point. It's not clear what the U.S. has to sell. We're doing QE2. QE2, the textbooks will tell us, if anything, will tend to weaken the dollar. So it's a little bit tough for the U.S. to say, we're not doing anything that'll weaken the dollar when the Fed is about to dump potentially a trillion of dollars into the financial system. So you do think that's possible? You do think the trillion is possible? Uh, certainly possible. All right, it, not not up front, but over, but over a 12-month period, that's $100 billion a month. Certainly that's in the range of possibility. Okay, a little higher than what we've heard, so that's <laughs> kind of exciting. So uh, you do think we're close to a resolution, but you don't see necessarily a prid quo quo for China? Well, right. Interesting. The Chinese, of course, and I don't think it's a coincidence, a day or two ago announced the first increase in interest rates in their country in a couple of years. And I think Chinese officials, when I've met with them, will say, look, we have a range of things we need to do to cool the economy. One of them is to let the exchange rate move. One of them is to, to adjust interest rates, and they've done that. All right. It'll be a good weekend. Rich Clarida, thanks so much for yeah. coming in. PIMCO's Rich Clarida joining us right here in the newsroom.